Good evening. Thank you very much. And welcome to Q&A live from the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. I'm Tony Jones, answering your questions tonight in the magnificent concert hall of the Sydney Opera House, iconoclast, feminist and historian Jermaine Greer, radical Trotskyist turned Burkean conservative Peter Hitchens, author Hannah Rosen, who argues that women are on the rise while men are on the way, and sex advice author and gay activist Dan Savage. Please welcome our panel. Thank you, and as usual, we're being simulcast on ABC News 24 and News Radio, and you can join the Twitter conversation with the Quanda hashtag that just appeared on your screen. Our first question tonight is from Tim Wright. My question is for Peter Hitchens. You have described yourself as an observer and record keeper of the collapse of Western civilization. To what extent is your resignation to defeat a lament for the passing of a world where moral absolutes still existed, hierarchy and order was respected, and nuclear families were the cultural norm. Is it not desirable that we have moved out of a world of black and white into one of technicolour? Wow. Peter Hitchens. Well, the first, the first summary of my opinions is absolutely right. But what that has to do with a world of black and white and a world of technicolour, I'm not quite sure. Uh, you, you seem to be suggesting that somehow a world in which people don't fulfill their obligations to their children, uh, desert their marriages, uh, don't keep to the laws, uh, are, are increasingly selfish and, and follow their own desires and, and abandon all kinds of ideas of, of self-restraint and patience is a better world than one where those things actually ruled. And I don't agree with you. Uh, the fact that the world is technicolor, <laughs> the fact the world is, is, is technicolor and full, of, and full of drugs and people who get drunk and people who abandon their husbands and wives, it doesn't seem to me to be an improvement. And it strikes me that it's time somebody said that actually this isn't necessarily a turn for the better. But in any case, when you're discussing all these, all these changes in our lives, you can't return to the past. It's futile to even attempt to. What we're always doing all the time is discussing what we're going to do with the future. At the moment, we're very busily choosing the wrong future in which some of us and all of our children are going to live. Hey, it's uh, a good you, thing we didn't bring our champagne out here. We actually <laughs> considered it. <laughs> yes. Peter, uh, you've obviously uh, bemoaned the decline, the moral decline of Great Britain. I mean, is it, is it the decline of Christian values that you're talking about primarily? Well, Christianity more or less collapsed in Europe after 1914 and the First World War. And uh, when it ceased to exist, all kinds of other things rushed in to take its place. But mostly what's rushed in to take its place is what I call selfism. Uh, the idea that we are all sovereign in our own bodies, that no one can tell us what to do with our own bodies, that everything that we do is okay, uh, provided we think we aren't harming anybody else. Uh, quite often the truth is that we are harming other people, but we're hiding it from ourselves. But who gets to decide what's corrupt? So, you know, drinking, drugs, gay sex, I mean, sort of where do you draw the line? Well, what it, seems totally arbitrary. Where, where, where do you draw the line? You draw, you, you, you draw the line fundamentally, as far as I'm concerned, around about the Sermon on the Mount and those instructions given to us. And I have absolutely no shame in saying that I believe that the Christian religion was the greatest possession which the human race had, which it's now in large parts of the world rather busily throwing away. I, I'm a firm believer in do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I just think there's more doing unto that's possible in my philosophy than yours. Well, I, I know that. <laughs> I think... You, you, do, you do an awful lot of things consent, un unto other people and indeed to yourself. Consent I, matters that, and that's harm That's your matters. affair, but it's not, it's not the same question. Consent matters and harm matters. If there's consent and no one is being harmed, it's no one's business what an individual chooses to do with his or her body. Y yes, but... The I, question, just, no, 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 it, it's, it, it's, it's, such, it's so essential to answer this. The people who say that they're not doing harm are almost invariably deceiving themselves. The, the, the people who divorce and say, oh, the children are happier as a and result. And the government should they're rush not. in to prevent the people from the, being self-deceptive, if the that's teen, indeed the, what they're the, doing? The teenager who takes drugs and becomes mentally ill and ruins his own life and that of his parents is doing harm to other people. But at the time they do these things, they say, no, my body is sovereign. I, I am a, a, a completely autonomous person. I don't harm anybody else. We lie to ourselves about this all the time. I lie to myself about it. You all lie to yourselves about it. You lie to yourself about Wait, it. So we about know that we harm other people. We harm let let me go to Jermaine Greer. We haven't heard from Jermaine yet. Uh, do you see any evidence of moral decline in the West? Uh, no. 
Uh, but I think what we have to be aware of is that there's another uh, spiritual and intellectual system that is rejecting the West and rejecting it in no uncertain fashion. Um, at the moment, we're involved in this terrible business in Egypt where Morsi, who was elected by the Egyptian people, is now going to be tried, and we're pretending that somehow he wasn't elected. Now, we have got to confront that fact that ordinary Egyptian people were Salafists and fundamentalists, and they rejected the Western way of life as fundamentally corrupt. Now, I don't stand on the same side as Peter because I think that the patriarchal system was corrupt, that it was a license to exploit and humiliate and oppress women and children. But you know what people don't understand is that patriarchy also oppresses men. It isn't the rule of men, it's the rule of old men who send young men to war to fight their battles for them. This is the system that Peter would like to defend. And this is the system that I have spent my life opposing. No, it's your, it's your misrepresentation. It's, it's, your, it's your misrepresentation of the system I would like to defend. It isn't the system. Uh, can I characterize the system you would like to defend? It's the conservatism of ick. I don't like that. Therefore, you should not be allowed to do it. I don't approve of drinking. I don't use drugs myself. I don't suck dick myself. Therefore, you should be legally prevented from doing those things. Well, Which isn't, that's radical. Yeah, that is and, not conservative. And, what is, and, what's, and what's so brilliant about that? Because there are things, I think, that, I we, see, that, that we see around us that, that we do They're not. pretty brilliant. There are things that we see around us that we do not like. And if we don't act to stop them, then we're, 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 we're guilty of But I don't of, of like it isn't a good place. enough reason yeah. to use yeah. the force of the state to stop it. I don't like cunnilingus. I'm not going to use the force of the well, state to prevent I, that from it happening. Is, <laughs> it's fantastic. The, 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 ease, the ease with which someone can fill a room with laughter by, by, by just being rude and unpleasant. I'm not, I'm not, okay, no, I, I, I'm I not being rude. I'm carrying it. It's not, 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 not particularly clever. Peter, Peter, just hang on. Uh, I'm uh, carrying uh, your uh, argument to its logical extreme. I'm not being rude for no reason. We points, as it were. Now, we've got another question, and we're going to continue the discussion based on the questions. The next question comes from Boren it? Uh, with the growing trend of internet hookups, sexting, and the prevalence of apps which combine smart devices with GPS tracking and offer the closest potential suitor for a quick, cheap, and purely hedonistic encounter, we have armed our generation with all the tools and platforms to normalize the culture of instant gratification. Is society so driven with personal pleasures that we're eroding the values of human relationships and reality-based interactions? Dan, let's start with you. I don't think the two people who met uh, via a hookup app uh, aren't having a hookup in reality. They're still having a human interaction, however it is that they were brought together. Um, any interaction, whatever its genesis, is as human as the humans involved in that interaction choose to be to each other. And there are a lot of really terrific relationships that post-internet and post-hookup apps and pre-internet and pre-hookup apps. Dan, pre can I just apps, you there? For the broader audience who may not know, can you explain what hookup apps are exactly. <laughs> well, they're very popular uh, with gay men because gay men are men and men are pigs. Um, <laughs> and also uh, safer, generally. But what? Uh, what are hookup apps? Um, hookup apps are little things on your phone where you can use GPS and you can say, I'm here in this location at this time, and you can see who's nearby. And if somebody is a, of, of a like mind and would like to hook up with you, you can hook up. There's a lot, people have a sort of a moral panic about these apps. Um, I think that's out of all proportion to what they actually do and the impact they actually have in a lot of people's lives. Usually the people who are fulminating about them or real, most concerned about them are people who haven't used them and don't know what actually goes on uh, during those interactions. There are a lot of terrific, long-term, stable, loving relationships that got their start uh, with a sleazy meeting. If your parents met because they were stoned out of their minds and had a hookup, they're not going to tell you. They're going to make up some bullshit story <laughs> about the mutual friend that introduced them named Mary Jane. <laughs> And that's really the only thing that, you know, I know a lot of people who are in long-term, stable, loving relationships, even marriages now, who met via hookup apps. 
And we need these apps because we have said now that it is not okay to hit on people at work, not okay to walk up to somebody on the bus or the street and ask them for their phone number. We've defined these things rightly so to make the world safer for women as sexual harassment. So we need these places that when you enter them, you were saying, you may approach me. When I'm in this space, whether it's virtual or a real space, like a kind of a pickup bar, in these arenas, it is okay to hit on me. In every other arena, for the most part, we have rightly decided that it is not okay just to walk up to somebody at work and hit on them. Uh, Peter Hitchens, I'll just bring you in here. You, you listen to that. I mean, <laughs> no. uh, do you see anything sort of wrong uh, with this concept of <laughs> hookup apps? Oh, you're setting him up. You're setting him up. Uh, I'm going to get no, on Grinder no, and see who's on right private. now say in this no. room. <laughs> I, do you want me to say anything or not? It, it seems to me that when the, the intimacy is something which is profoundly private, and often if people are mistreated when they're intimate with other people, they are severely damaged. And the idea that sexual relations can be conducted in this casual and mechanical fashion is extremely cruel and crude and dismisses the concept of human love from a very important part of our relations. And I think that's a pity. He doesn't think it's a pity. Uh, he wants a crude and, uh, and as far as I, I, I'm concerned, individualistic, <laughs> unrestrained, and, the and, 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 and totally selfish the world. There is a definite difference between me and him. I'd just like to emphasize it. I think <laughs> a society that... I think, uh, society, I think, society in Peter, which his Peter. ideas rule will be one you will very much regret having created. Uh, I, I think that is becoming clearer, the difference. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make it but, uh, absolutely let me, let me hear, plain. I think it's pretty clear. Yeah, uh, yeah. Jermaine. The, the interesting part of, of the question was about instant gratification. Uh, because what is the mechanism that has told us all that we can have instant gratification? You want something, you can have it, you can have it now. It's called advertising. Mm -hmm. And the advertising of prostitution is pornography, which tells you the same thing. Sex is difficult. Sex is a blood sport. You can be hurt. But pornography tells you you can have gratification without running any risk at all. You don't even have to converse. You don't even have to be laughed at. It's safe as houses. And this is the kind of sexuality that it has been promoted for the last 50 years. Now, it's interesting that what the app is doing is saying, go out, make a contact and it's leading you into an area where you might be safe from misunderstanding. I think you're still running a risk, but I think our kids and we have got to understand that sex is not bland. And what worries me about your scenario is it seems rather bland. It is still dangerous out there, and you have to go with courage. You have to go with love. Um, the idea that love is something that you feel for somebody you have within your ambit, who is in your power, there was a time when we understood that inequality negated love, that love could only exist between equals, that once one person was under the thumb of another, there could be no love, only submission. And this is where Peter and I would absolutely differ. Okay, um, I'll let you get back in on that in a minute, Dan, but there's a specific question uh, for Hannah on this subject. It comes from Bridget Meany. Hannah Rosen, you are a strong advocate of the hookup culture and suggest it has been an engine for female progress. What authority do you feel you have to speak on the optimum sexual lifestyle of all women of different class, socioeconomic levels, culture, values and religion and their respective progress? Do you feel your views discredit as unempowered women who exercise their choice to limit their sexual activity to that of a monogamous relationship? You're a monster. Um, what authority do I have? Just extensive experience in the hookup culture. Um, I'm just kidding. Hookup culture came before my time. You did go to study, study this phenomenon, though, didn't you? Deeply, yes. Mm. 
I deeply studied the phenomenon. I would say that that's a mischaracterization of my position. I am not an advocate of the hookup culture. I'm just an observer of the hookup culture. It exists. And in fact, what you say about social classes is interesting because there is a difference between how social classes interact with the hookup culture. In general, it's upper class elite women who are more comfortable with the hookup culture. There's great studies done in college where the working class women are slightly shocked by the hookup culture when they get there and have to be sort of slowly acculturated to it. So, so it's different. And I would say, you know, it's been a great education for me because I write about the hookup culture and then women have written back to me explaining to me what I got wrong, which is to say, no, we don't like one night stands, but no, we're not looking to get married when we're in college, but we've created this third kind of relationship, which is unfamiliar to me. It didn't really exist when I was in college, which is intimate, which is sexual, which is respectful, but which is not on the path to marriage. And so that seems okay with me. It just seems like one kind of relationship. It's not the only kind, but it's one legitimate kind. Yeah, you did actually conclude that feminist progress actually depends upon this hookup yeah, culture. I, mean, I suppose that's why yes. people take the view that you are an advocate. Yeah, well, no, I'm just an observer. It's not that I think it's great. I'm just saying I, I, I object to the fact that everyone looks at the hookup culture and says that women are oppressed by it and it's created you know, by men, for men, and, and women are suffering. It's not entirely true. If you talk to women, they don't want to get married. You know, Women get married later and later in Australia at something like 30, right? So, so you're not going to go from 18 to 30 and have no intimate relationships, right? So you've got to create some other way of having relationships. So we can't just look at it and say it's horrifying women are suffering. I'm going to throw to Dan Savage because I think you did want to respond to what uh, Peter Hitchens said earlier. I don't remember what he said earlier at this point. <laughs> but I disagree with it, whatever it was. <laughs> That's curious. I'd just like to say something about that. Speaking as someone who teaches young women, I find that one of the greatest problems we have is that, you know, young women enter into relationships at university that are friendly, they're intimate, they're fun, but they're not uh, a binding uh, arrangement. It's not a prelude to a marriage. And generally, when exam time comes around, the guys get a bit serious and it all stops. And my young women fall to pieces because they really believe that this was it. And I want to say to them, he's a boy. He wants sex. He wants friendship. He wants fun. He's not ready to commit himself. And why did you go more than halfway? And why did you believe that this was the one when it's, going to, when it's actually now completely destroying you? Um, you I'm happy for women to be less self-deceiving in encounters that are themselves fun and sexy. Um, and you never know, sometimes you're still seeing the same guy 60 years later. I am. Uh, <laughs> I, but you, you, don't, you don't seriously believe that there aren't young women out there who want fun, who want sex, who want companionship. And who are not destroyed at the end of a relationship. Who are not, it's well, not that I'm, all women are trading sex for male attention. There are women out there who want sex. Well, I understand that, but they overvalue, they misinterpret the signals that they're given. Uh, because um, shacking up, you know, having, a, having a, a regular boyfriend is now important even when you're in high school. When you're 15, 16, you get dumped, you lose prestige in your group, and people will beat up on you for that. I mean, it's, it, our young women are sexually active way, beyond, way before they're supposed to be, and they enter into this really complex system of relationships that they systematically misinterpret, partly because they're very young, and they take punishment. And I hate seeing it. I hate seeing them utterly égaré, completely distraught because of what has happened, because the young man has moved on, can gone I, away. Can, can I just say two things? One is what Germaine said some, a little while back, uh, which is that I would maintain absolutely that, that marriage can be and most often is a partnership of equals and not a, a relationship of dominance. And so to the, to the people on the other side of the table, I say you are making a fundamental mistake. You are mistaking pleasure for happiness, and they are two very different things. I'm going to uh, move on because... <laughs> 
There'd be a very long answer to that, I've no doubt, but we've got other things to talk about. We've got another question. It's from Erica Nook. Nock. I'll give that. Um, my question's for Jermaine. Um, while women today are extremely competent and have achieved high levels of education and workforce participation, as a young woman in my 20s, it's still apparent that there's quite a large gap between the two genders in many regards of their lives, but in particular in relation to pay, um, household duties, and the decisions women have to make in relation to families and careers. So my question is, what do you see as the key factors over the next 10 to 20 years that will bring us closer to that point of equality? If you don't mind, Jermaine, I'll throw that first mm. to Hannah, because she's actually written a book pretty much on this subject, um, which is called The End of Men. Um, so you take us in that direction first, and then I'll go back to Jermaine. Um, so, so you are getting to the heart of the matter, right? So, so there are these differences in caretaking. Uh, there are these differences in, in pay. But the long-term trend is that you know women's pay increases and increases and increases, and men's pay decreases and decreases and decreases over the course of the century. And so, so you see that sort of women are getting more dominant, stronger, are are, are sort of you know uh, it, it's changing for women. So while there are still gaps, it's really changing for women. Now, the one thing is the caretaking. Uh, that's, that's what I come to at the end of my book is we need to create sort of more space for men to do things in the domestic sphere without judging them for that, which I think we are doing. You know, we are doing. It's, it's starting to happen. Now, your book actually looks, it seems to me, mostly at post-GFC recession America and the mm -hmm. shift that's going on. Where we've actually seen women become the largest group in the workforce. Is it just an American phenomenon you're talking about? No, it's not just an American phenomenon. It looks different in different countries. Uh, for example, you know, the words uh, deliberately barren, I don't think would be spoken in America the way they are part of your political culture, apparently. But um, in, so, you know. In certain quarters. In certain quarters, exactly. Only in our country, that's reserved for the Bible, the, the words deliberately barren. Um, so, so, you know, did different countries have different... It's not, uh, what I mean to say is it's not commonly used, that phrase. It was used once. <laughs> okay. All right. I won't pin it on the yeah. whole of the country. Yeah. All right. I got you. Probably I a good idea. You. Yes. Except that your current prime minister also said that women were, you know, physiologically uh, not suited for leadership. So, you know... Let's hear from Jermaine Greer on the... The question was originally asked to you, so I'll throw it to you, and then we'll hear from the men on the panel. Yes, now, uh, the difficulty is that women are achieving parity in the workforce at a time when the workforce is spectacularly disabled, when it has no combination, it has no corporate power, it is uh, people uh, fighting all the time about workplace agreements where the worker is always at a disadvantage because he's dealing with the corporation, the corporation's lawyers and everything else. Now, I'm not happy about the fact that women are now being seen to be a biddable, reliable workforce for a capitalist system that is not under any pressure, really, from the workforce. And it's happening also in certain professions. Women become dominant in medicine, the prestige of medicine goes down. So it doesn't really make me happy. I have never argued for equality. Equality with men in the corporate world is misery. It's, an ex it's a really destructive system. And we're saying now, you know, women have got into middle management, wow. They're going to get into upper management. They're going to be catapulted into boardrooms where they won't really understand what's going on because it's been decided in the men's room or on the golf course. Um, so at the same time as we're saying women are becoming dominant numerically in the workforce, they actually exercise less in the way of power in collective bargaining than any workforce ever yeah. has before. Can I, can I just say, uh, yeah. I'd like so, to hear your yeah, response yeah, yeah. to okay. that. So I think you're not allowing for the possibility that women change the workforce. You're right. Like the American workforce, for example, particularly does not understand that people are human beings who raise children. You know, we don't even have maternity leave. So we're not a great shining example here. But I, I take the example of Norway, where, you know, they forced <laughs> women on corporate boards. We all wish we were Sweden and Norway. I know. If we could all be Sweden and Norway, it would be awesome. 
But just, just well, let's... You could be, you just have to change your policies. I, I really don't look Swedish. I think it's just not possible for me. But, you know, other people out there in the audience maybe could but pass But there are plenty Swedish. of Swedes who look like you. Don't worry. What is, what is all this stuff? Women have stormed every profession. Women run the BBC in Britain. I expect they run the ABC in Australia. They, 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 do, they dominate huge areas of professional life. The, the struggle for equality in education in the professions was won decades ago. And that's and a what problem? Is, what, is really what is really fascinating... What is really fascinating is this extraordinary alliance between radical leftist feminists and corporate multinational business, which is probably the most sinister and cynical alliance since the Nazi-Soviet pact. And under which, <laughs> under which these, these, 60s, these 60s leftists uh, applaud as millions of women are marched into wage slavery uh, and exploitation by corporations. The people who, who claim that women were being exploited by, by marriage and by raising children don't raise a whisper against the immense exploitation of women by, 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 by corporate business, not a word. And this endless, continual, ceaseless denigration of the most important and responsible task most of us will ever do, the raising of the next okay, generation. OK, I'm going to pause. No, don't stop oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm stopping you. I'm, I'm making I'm, my point. Wait a minute, I'm if it's the most you. important task, yeah, I'm stopping you because that, that, we have no, a question. No, no, don't stop me. Excuse the me, we have a question. Yeah, if it's the most important task, I have a question. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Can I? No, no, no. I haven't stopped anybody else. One thing. I haven't stopped anybody else. I know you're stopping me. I noticed that. To make a point, you can respond Right. Kimberly Adler has a question on this subject. Thank you. Um, do you think it's possible that the women's liberation movement has gone too far away from the primary role of women to nurture and raise their children? The current role of mothering is being performed by paid caregivers, and my observations are showing me that there is a direct correlation between narcissism rising in the population and early separation of mother and child. The women who can do it all tend to have children with narcissistic traits. We ship our kids off to strangers to raise them and wonder why everyone is tired and depressed. We are allowing narcissists to rule our world. And, sorry, we are allowing the narcissists who currently rule our world to tell us how to raise our children. Well, clearly we need to re-enslave women. You are. That's the solution. <laughs> Kim Kimberly, Kimberly, you are fantastically brave. Be careful on your way home. The, the, feminists will, the feminists will get you for that. But of course it's true. We, we, this, this, this extraordinary pressure to hand over young children to paid strangers while their actual mothers are Wait, are, are why do the women have yeah, to do it if it's again. such an important job? You don't like... You Dan don't like... has done a fine job well, raising his child. I'll tell, shall I tell you a very simple reason why? <laughs> it, it may not apply to you, but in a lot of cases they're better at it. There, you see, heresy. Jermaine, let's hear um, from you. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> what world Anybody is... Anybody who's been involved in raising children knows that women are better at it. Oh, my God. That's <laughs> just see? crazy. You can't, well, you can't somebody... even I'm say sorry. it, even though it's true. I'm sorry, true. what Wait we've seen the power on studies of, of same-sex parents completely uh, gives the lie to that statement, that children raised by same-sex couples are as happy, as healthy, as well-adjusted <laughs> as children raised by opposite-sex couples, and included in those studies are children raised by gay male couples, as my son has been raised, and they do just as well, because what matters is love and nurturing and safety and protection and caring adults who are invested in you, not parents with particular genital sets. Right. Okay, our questioner would like to get back involved, Kimberly. Yeah. Like Sorry. Sorry. I think my point's been a bit misunderstood. My husband actually stayed at home for six months to raise our child. It's not about the mother or the father. It's the fact that a parent is home to raise the child, to teach that child empathy and compassion for others, and bring community together to work on the problems that are coming forward. Narcissistic children lack empathy and are selfish. And that's what I'm seeing being produced by children whose mothers aren't able to I'd raise them. I'd like to see them. the data, as opposed to yeah, yeah. being I mean, the, the Hannah, Hannah, research. Hannah, 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 I saw you nodding earlier during that question, so um, which parts did you agree with? Well, I don't remember which parts <laughs> I agreed with. I must have had a head. 
Um, <laughs> try, try to keep your dinner down. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, um, I, uh, I object because I think the, the problem today is not uh, the lack of time that parents spend with their children. Uh, in fact, time use studies show exactly the opposite, that, that in this culture where women work more, we spend more hours with our children than we used to. I, I, I totally understand parents should raise their children. That doesn't mean they have to be with them all day, every day. I mean, you can come home at 5 o'clock and you know, have a nice dinner with your child and, and nurture them and love them. I mean, what, the, the, it's, it's the hours that you spend that are going to turn them into a narcissist? It just, you know, I think a stay-at-home mom has just as likely a chance to turn her child into one thing or another as a working mom. What's, what's the difference? Jermaine. I'm quite interested in the whole question of turning your children over to other people to raise, because my feeling is that we're way short of the amount of uh, preschooling that we need and nursery care that we need. But I also seem to remember an English system where children were sent away to school, to boarding schools, and it, it bred a generation of rulers of the entire British Empire. <laughs> uh, what, was, well, what was different then? Well, what, what are, you, are you saying I'm sitting here defending that? I haven't said a word about it. I'm against it. And, uh, and well, on it's the, a on bit on late on now. On it's principle. over. Well, I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, you, brought it up, you brought it up. You suggested I was in favor of it. I say I'm against it. Future generations will look on our treatment of children as we look on the Victorians for sending, for sending children up chimneys. They will be amazed at the cruelty and neglect which we showed to our children when we were so rich. Can I quickly ask you, the question that was raised there was whether children are becoming narcissistic. And uh, so uh, do, you have, do you agree with that? I, I, I have no idea whether they're becoming narcissistic, <laughs> but I think a lot of them are, are, are becoming seriously unhappy. Dan. I want to see some data. Like, we yeah. can sit around and we can just assert that a certain kind of family structure that's kind of been imposed on all of us by the economy. Um, but, but look, that stay-at-home parent thing was really an aberration, that there was a time in the 20th century when one person could earn enough money to support a whole family, to buy a house and maybe a second home and a car and go on vacations. And that was an aberration. I also don't think a that... luxury, also okay. a luxury that, you know, there's been few moments in history where, any, where both, where parents could afford to stay home. That's a sort of modern luxury. It's... Okay, let's move along. You're watching uh, Q&A at the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. The next question comes from Mitchell Grant. Uh, my question is for Peter Hitchens. Uh, you have said that the demise of the UK Conservative Party is inevitable and necessary in order to weed out what you call useless Tories. <laughs> what do you think it will take to revive conservatism in Britain? Are far-right populist parties necessary for such a revival? And lastly, does Tony Abbott, our Prime Minister, represent lost conservative values that you would support? Or is he just an Australian version of the demise of conservatism that you see in Britain? Well, the, the, the last bit first. From what I can see, Mr Abbott is very much on the, on the lines of, of, of modern fake conservatism. That is. Uh, quite a lot of, of neoliberalism about the economy, a, a far too close association with Rupert Murdoch. Uh, and uh, a, fair amount of, a fair amount of rhetoric about, about moral conservatism close to elections, accompanied by doing nothing, whatever about it, when he has the chance to do so. I, I, I think that is a general characteristic of conservative parties who have, have for many, many years in, in the Anglosphere countries been betraying their supporters in that way. And not merely really, not really them, but the, the supposedly left-wing parties, the Labour parties of the Anglosphere, have, have also been betraying their conservative-minded supporters. They have become factions of, of metropolitan bourgeois bohemians who couldn't care less about the conditions of the poor uh, and who are merely concerned with the... The, the, luxury, the luxury lives they live in, 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 the, in, their, in their capital cities. And so there is a complete divorce between what many people want out of life and what their politicians desire. In terms of the British Conservative Party, if you really want to know, I mean, the, the best thing that could possibly happen to it would be that it split and collapsed, and, and I do all that I can to hurry this on, because nothing, <laughs> nothing, could be, uh, it, 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 nothing could be worse than it. I could carve a better political party out of a banana than the <laughs> British Conservative Party with any difficulty indeed. But, but the problem is that in, 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 the, in our system, and I think in yours as well, people vote tribally. And as long as people continue, as long as these parties continue to exist at elections, enough people will vote tribally 
to keep them alive. And it's only if they collapse that the, the conservative-minded people of, 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 of your country and mine will realize they have actually got no friends in government. Peter, um, you, you did do whatever you could to uh, hasten the demise of the uh, Cameron government. Yeah, in not fact, very you, effective. But, in fact, well, you, you actually advised people, or your readers, uh, to vote for UKIP, which is a populist, no, no, well, party, uh, yeah, populist okay. party, primarily uh, anti-immigration in its basis. Well, I advised them to do that because they, I, I kept saying that they shouldn't vote at all, but they all seemed to think that voting was some tremendously important process, which it, 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 actually it isn't. If you go into a shop and you're offered a load of goods which you don't want to buy, you don't buy any of them. Uh, so why an election, you vote for people you don't like. But Jermaine Greer, all right. Okay, we're, uh, we'll bring Jermaine in on that one liner. Uh, for me, the greatest mystery is that Tony Abbott is a Rhodes Scholar. <laughs> <laughs> he is a product of one of our finest universities. British, I mean. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, so was Bill Clinton, I mean, so what? Well, the interesting thing is that it looks as if a populist right-wing government has to pretend to be extremely stupid. <laughs> and Tony Abbott is very good at that. <laughs> well, Jermaine, I mean, it's obvious you don't like him. Uh, but <laughs> the, no, the, seriously, it's not like even him. worth a laugh, in fact, because there are plenty of people out there who do like him. And one of the reasons, uh, particularly among men in Australia, they like him is because he's, he's given up uh, political correctness and he's changing the nature of the country, or trying to. Well, are you happy about that? It's, it's not a question of whether I'm happy. I'm simply <laughs> making a point. Well, why would any... You well, have to, so, somehow you have to explain why he's won by a landslide. Well, the uh, complete shambolic nature of the Labour Party would seem to be a reason. <laughs> and the, manif the manifest crookedness of the Labour Party would seem to be a reason. And it just goes on proliferating. More and more people come out of the woodwork. More and more shady deals, which is a curious thing about Labour parties. They always get into trouble over things like property and shady deals involving shopping malls and stuff. <laughs> uh, whereas the Conservatives sort of plod on, and all they ever do is jump into bed with the wrong people, <laughs> which basically makes us kind of like them. <laughs> Dan, how does this look um, from your perspective in the United States? You've seen change of government here. It's very similar in many respects to the new government or the relatively new government in Canada. I just think that you're having your George W. Bush moment, and hopefully in a, <laughs> in a few years you will have your Barack Obama moment. Hannah Rosen. Uh, well, uh, what, what's been fascinating to me to watch the so that a Gillard Abbott switch over is, you know, in our country, we, we do all our sort of racism and sexism in code, and here you do it kind of overtly, you know? So, so you know, she gets to call him uh, an, a, a prime misogynist, you know, which are words that Hillary Clinton would never use. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, he gets to say to her, what was the other fantastic thing he said? Oh, that she needed to make an honest woman of herself. That was the other <laughs> fabulous thing he said. So, you know, they, they, they do these, these fights overtly. Okay, let's move on. We've got another question. It's from Amelia Turzon. <laughs> As an Australian in her, in her mid-twenties, I've grown up with iconic images of protest, rebellion, and flower power from the 60s, 70s, and even the early 80s. Yet I don't feel that I've experienced any of this ideology in my lifetime. Most people my age seem much more interested in buying the new iPhone 5 than they do in protesting against unjust wars or the corrupt global financial system. Am I correct to feel, as I do, that I've been born into a particularly conservative generation? Was I born without the will to question, or do I just have things too good to bother fighting for anything? Jermaine, let's start with you. One of the interesting things about feminism is you have, to en you have to encounter the real nature of a woman's life in our society at one of the painful points. You know, you come through school 
and you're probably doing better than the boys, and everyone will tell you you're doing better than the boys. What they won't tell you is that the most successful boys didn't bother doing well at school at all. So somehow you've been suckered into being um, conforming with a system which is meant to make you uh, a useful member of society in the sense that you will have a job and you will carry out that job and you'll be promoted at the snail's pace that women are promoted at. Um, it's when other things happen, like when you find yourself um, having pregnant, having your first baby and discovering what the politics are of the birthplace and how we still have preventable deaths of mothers. Or you may find it when you're actually looking after an aging parent and you suddenly realize that the entire sector is under-resourced, that there's no pre prestige connected with doing it, and that actually caring, we talk about education, 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 we do nothing but disable it and nickel and dime it and try to do it on the cheap. We spend vast amounts of money making war, uselessly for the most part, and we don't actually consider the question of doing the best by our own people. Now, if you're constantly being told that you've got it all, uh, then you might even begin to believe it. It comes to the point where you actually start thinking, what is it that I do have? You know, everyone says, this is the property-owning democracy. What does that mean? That means that you enter into debt. That means that you're a debt slave. That means that you're a you have a lifetime of debt and DIY, as I used to explain this, that you're actually, you've actually been tamed as a member of a body politic. You don't have a long-term vision. No, you're actually being told that you need to think short-term. Everybody says it's what's in your pocket, it's what you can buy. Okay, Jermaine, no I'm one gonna, talks about a vision of the future, the, uh, the, ever. The, the question was about, this, in a way, a sort of nostalgia <laughs> for um, a kind of revolutionary period in the 60s, possibly the 70s. But, um, I, yeah. but she didn't have nostalgia because she wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, what, but she... you were, you see, and I guess maybe she was trying to work out what you thought, whether that nostalgia is well placed or not, whether it really was revolutionary or whether it was just a small group of people, highly educated, who were pushing those boundaries. Well, don't, don't imagine that you, that you need a large group of people to make a revolution. You don't. Let's go, so let's just go back and hear from Amelia. She's just I'm just going to re-clarify. So I feel that compared to my parents, who challenge things so much, that most of all, like the most of the people around me don't really challenge things that much. They don't challenge politics. They don't challenge a lot of ideals. They don't even challenge the idea that we live in this completely consumer society. So I wanted to know from the panel, do they think that my generation is less... It, it's challenging society less than their generation was? Okay. Well, I, I, was, I was in the 60s too. And, um, I think you were, you were, in fact, a Trotskyist. I was, a, I was a revolutionary socialist, yes. And, and, and there are two theories about this. One is it's quite plausible, which is they put something in the water because we all seem to go completely <laughs> round the bend. Uh, the, the other is that, in fact, my generation, amazingly selfish, shouting loudly t uh, for, for what they wanted, got what they wanted, and have been contented ever since. And they, they got it on behalf of you. Whether you're happy with what they got is up to you, but I think that's the reason why it's different. Hannah. I, I just want to give a little credit to your generation, because there, there is one great struggle, which is gay rights. That is, that is a huge struggle that this generation has, has brought to bear. Gay marriage, you guys, are still, uh, you guys are still working it out, but I think that's you know, you should take credit for that in your generation. And remember all of those movements, the anti-war movement, uh, the, the, the feminist movement, the liber women's liberation movement, that, those were sort of generated, they came about when people became supremely uncomfortable. They were forced up against a wall and then they pushed back hard. And so don't look at sort of AIDS activists in the 80s and think, God, they were all so motivated. Why aren't we like that? They got so motivated, my generation of gay men at that time, because we were fucking dying. And we had a gun to our heads, and we had to come out and fight. It's not that everybody said, hey, let's like, find something to fight about. Here's this AIDS thing. Let's fight about that. Oh, so oh. just keep your eyes open, and when the moment arrives for your generation, if it arrives for your generation, all, all revolutionaries, it'll identify itself to you. All, all revolutionaries claim to be fighting against the oppression of other people when, in fact, they're fighting for their own personal advantage. Ooh. Okay. On that I'm one fighting line, for the... Go again. Well, the gay rights movement is fighting for the advantage of being treated equally and being full and members of society. We are not fighting to take anything from anyone else. Say, and says you. That, 
that is not some selfish goal that we had in mind. Like, oh, it'll no, be really no selfishness, to be no selfishness in involved in it at all. Not a bit, no. Well, no. Okay, nah. well, so I'm not but, uh, trying to prevent you from living your life. But well, of course I'm selfish, I, but I don't pretend not to be. But there's something you need to remember, which is the overriding of all of this is a kind of warfare. Uh, we weren't really fighting. We were arguing. We were pleading. We were demonstrating. We were doing street theater. We were trying to suggest to people that there was a better way to live. I mean, I wrote a book because I th could see that women were being denied nobility because they weren't able to be responsible for their own actions. Their whole lives were lived as if, you know, look what you made me do, because women didn't have autonomy. The first thing you have to do to become a moral creature is to secure autonomy, to stand up and be responsible for what you do yourself. And it wasn't so much that we were out there slugging, um, although I can remember terrible moments like when we marched on the uh, Capitol in Washington and found ourselves confronted by an entirely black police force, a piece of completely cynical opposition between the black working class policemen and the middle class white women. Uh, we went through all these strange confrontations and we got scared, we got beaten up, we got our houses were broken into by the police and all that good stuff. Um, but the fight wasn't in terms of hitting someone, hurting someone, defeating someone. It was getting a moment to actually say something clearly and be heard. Okay, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna bring you back because I've got a question uh, that you might like to comment on. The question is from Claire King. Sorry, Claire, just wait for the microphone. There you go. A few weeks ago, in this very auditorium, Julia Gillard explained her reluctance to embrace gay marriage uh, as not a result of prejudice, but because it seemed, it seemed abhorrent to her that women should be given from their fathers to their husbands. Regardless of gender, is marriage still relevant? Dan Savage, that with you. <laughs> Well, marriage, I think, is hugely relevant, particularly to sexual minorities. You know, one of the things that marriage allows you to do is to choose for yourself who your immediate next of kin is. Uh, and that matters very much to people who may have homophobic relatives. If Terry and I should be so lucky, my husband Terry and I have been together for 20 years, if we should be so lucky as to live for 50 years, there is arguably a, a scenario under which one of us could be dying in the hospital and some fifth cousin, 10th removed, could blow in and say, I am the immediate next of kin, absent our ability and freedom to marry. Uh, marriage is, is hugely relevant, and it's only as patriarchal an institution as you choose to make it. Uh, people who are queer who want to marry, gay people, lesbians who wish to marry, we're constantly told that we're seeking to redefine the institution of marriage. The truth is that straight people redefined the institution of marriage already. Marriage now is the legal union of two autonomous and equal individuals, period, the end. Everything else is optional. Your marriage can be monogamous or not, you can have children or not, it can be for life or not, it can be religious or not. Uh, the wife can submit joyfully to the husband, as the Southern Baptists in the United States urge wives to do, or the husband can submit joyfully to the wife, as the female dominance fans uh, urge husbands to do. <laughs> Two people get to create their marriage for themselves. So for Julia Gilliard to hide behind a defunct and obsolete definition of marriage as some sort of sexist and patriarchal institution, which it once was and is no longer because straight people redefined it, I think is hypocritical and absurd and transparently horseshit. Peter Hitchens. <laughs> Diane Atkinson is absolutely right about one thing, uh, which is that heterosexual marriage has been redefined. Uh, to the point where it is dying very rapidly in Western societies. Uh, it's become easier to get out of a marriage than it is to get out of a car leasing agreement. Uh, and as a result, the, many people are not getting married in the first place. I don't know what the statistics are here, but in my own country, marriage is dying out as a thing which, which people do. Uh, and increasingly, it, is, it has been sidelined. And that is far, it is, it is the, the crucial issue of the modern Western world as to whether marriage will survive as a relationship at all. I think it should. Uh, they probably think it, it shouldn't, but the, we're, I absolutely we're, 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 moving, we're moving, we're moving towards a, a position where the only people who are interested in getting married 
our, our, our lesbian clergy women. And I, I look forward to the, <laughs> to the, to the day. Okay, when, no, I look forward to the day when the, Archbishop, when the female <laughs> Archbishop of Canterbury is, actually, is married in a lesbian marriage to the female Archbishop of York. I actually think. I think Hannah should speak to this because what we see now is a real class because division. Because I'm a lesbian clergy Because you're a lesbian clergy woman. Yes. <laughs> because we see a real class difference on yes. marriage. And when people have economic security to a certain extent and they have a good education, those people tend to marry and stay married when they marry. I'm sure you don't support strong unions, living wage jobs, economic security and economic justice, but nothing would go further to strengthen the institution of marriage than those kinds of securities and equalities. Also, I have to say the nostalgia drives me crazy because the fact is that the working class is not getting married and yet they, they are forced to cling to this ideal of marriage because everyone keeps telling them marriage is a thing, they have to get married, when we would be much better off if we did things like create social policies that treated three people who, say, lived in a house and had a child together and supported those people whether or not they were married. That's what America needs to do. We can't force people to get married you know, through nostalgia the force of nostalgia. Why, why did you gonna... get married? Because you did, and you've got a number of children as well. Because I, you know, I did what people do. I didn't think about it. I'm not a gay rights activist. I'm, you know, I just got married because people get married. You I got honestly, straight married. I got straight married. I just, you know, got married. <laughs> Jermaine. <laughs> well, I, d I mean, I think marriage is a terrible system. Um, <laughs> I think it's a terrible system for lots of reasons. We live too long. We change too much. Our lives are constantly being rebuilt as to whether we're in an industry, out of it, in a creative activity, da 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 da. We meet new people. We turn into different people. Which is why divorce isn't always a tragedy. This idea that if two people outlive a marriage, that that marriage was a failure, I think is something we need to discard. Oh, no. that you know, we tell people that if you, you know, if somebody dies, congratulations, that was a successful marriage. But if you part, and it was an amicable parting, you were together 25 years, you raised a couple kids during that time, you were married, um, and then you move on to perhaps new partners, new interests, a sort of whole new stage of life. Why can't we say that was a successful marriage and now those two people are in new successful marriages? Well, I'm, I'm in that position because my marriage lasted three weeks. And <laughs> <laughs> And I, I don't know that you are in And that people position. said, your marriage failed. And I said, no, it didn't fail. It was just short. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we're, we're fast running out of time. Let's go to our next question, which is, is from Anna Christie. <laughs> oh. Anna Christie. Oh, hi. Uh, it's a question for Peter. I'm fascinated by your conversion from revolutionary to authoritarian. And <laughs> I. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask how did this turnaround in your personal values occur, and was it an epiphany, or was it a series of doubts that eventually weighed on you and convinced you that you were wrong? Well, hang on a minute. First of all, revolutionaries are tremendously authoritarian. Uh, it's revolutionaries who build gulags and, and set up the KGB. Uh, rev revolutionaries are far more authoritarian than I am. Uh, but the fundamental reason why I no longer hold the infantile views which I held in my late <laughs> teens and early 20s is precisely that, that I grew up. The thing which astonishes me is that so many of my generation did not grow up. And still, while they're drawing their pensions, they, they have revolutionary opinions and attend Rolling Stones concerts. So how do you, what how what do you, is wrong with these people? <laughs> How do you hope to bring about the world, to, to, to return the world to the state you would like to see it in without authoritarian Oh, I gave that, I gave that up long ago. It would only, it would only make me miserable. I, I, I know that you people have won. Uh, I just, all, 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 that, all, that, all that I seek to do Which is, is why to, you have to be gay see, married all, now all and I use seek drugs to do is, now with the rest all, of us. No, all that I seek to do is to tell the truth about you and what you want while it's still allowed to do so. Because no, you Peter, are, you are so uh, fantastically intolerant. What, what do you mean when you say, you people? I mean, the, I mean the cultural revolution. I mean the cultural and moral revolution which has, which has swept the Western world since the collapse of Christianity. Which I'm not has cha changed our societies, as anybody who's lived through it knows, out of all recognition in the, in the course of 50 years, and in my view, for the worse. He's part of it, she's part of it. For all I know, you're part of it, but I am, I am not. That, okay, now, you're paranoid and you're projecting by saying we are you intolerant. You see, this is, this is the you intolerance. Have... I, am, I am, because I hold an opinion different from his, he has become suddenly a qualified psychoanalyst 
who can tell me, uh, who can tell me that, that my opinions are not opinions which I am uh, entitled to hold, You're but, entitled but, to but, 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 but are a, but are a pathology. And this is the, this is the absolute seedbed of totalitarianism. When you start believing that the opinions of other people are a pathology, then you are in the beginning. You're the one sitting the there pathologizing the other people's choices. That leads to the secret you are the one the sitting there saying that society is sick and damaged. You cannot imagine because that because that anybody else. Because other people are now as free as you'll white have, men you'll, used you'll to have be. the whole world to yourself, Sid. You can't imagine that anybody else is entitled to hold a view different from yours without having some kind of personal You're, defect. That's what's wrong with you. Okay, He's filibustering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you get a chance now. You are absolutely entitled to hold your opinions, but you That's sit not what you really think. Well, hang on, hang on. You're just let saying him, that for public consumption. Peter, uh, let him finish, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah. You sit there pathologizing other people's choices. You sit there saying that other people being free to live their lives by their own light in some way oppresses you when it oppresses you in no way whatsoever. You are free not to get gay married. You are free not to use drugs. You are free not to drink. You are free to stay married to one person for the rest of your life. You are free to stay home and raise your wife's children so they always have a parent by their side. You are not free to sit there and say that other people being oh. just as free as you are to live their lives and make their own choices in some way is yeah. damaging you personally, in some way destroying society. People are freer now, happier now. It's a less intolerant world than it used to be that's because that, people so, like me are now right. empowered this, this to so look personal. at people like you Could and I say you are full of shit. Before. Could I? It's a, it's a rally. Okay. It's a rally. Hold on. We it's actually do need to hear. Why do you do this? Why do you do this? I can't talk. Well, while you do that, while you do that, I can't talk, and you know it. And that's to your, and that's, to, and that's to your, and that's to your shame because silencing opponents is a very wicked thing to want to do. You've been it, a lot it, of things you, you tonight, said, but you've not been personal. silenced. This is very personal, I'll reply to it. I'm a very rich and fortunate person. I can, I can and, I, and I'm coming towards the end of, end of my life anyway. I can personally escape many of the consequences of this, but, but most people can't, they can't afford to. And if you, and I leave aside some of the things you mentioned, but a society in which the, the use of, of illegal drugs is widespread and, un, and, and unrestrained, is one in which everybody is affected by the consequences, whatever they themselves do. It's, it's like that ridiculous bumper sticker, uh, don't like abortion, don't have one, uh, to which my reply has always been, don't like murder, don't commit one. The fact is, if a society permits, if a society permits things to happen which damage the lives of many people, uh, who, as, as I've said earlier, as a result of the, the, the selfish unwillingness of those who do those things to recognize that they have Forcing women to give birth against their will everybody. damages yeah, women. I mean, we have, we have, those of us who oppose the Cultural Revolution and think that it's a mistake are entitled to say so for the moment. You are entitled to say so. For the moment. You will always be entitled okay, to I'm say going, so. We're, we're nearly out of time, I'm sorry to say. I'm going to go to a final question which you'll all be able to respond to and in your own way. Uh, the question comes from Lisa Malouf. <laughs> Which so-called dangerous idea do you each think would have the greatest potential to change the world for the better if it were implemented? Dan, let's start with you. Oh, that's oh my a God! Hard one. That's, you got to give us a minute to think about that. <laughs> uh, population control. There's too many goddamn people on the planet. And I don't know if that's a. You know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. I believe that women should have the right to control their bodies. Sometimes in my darker moments, I'm anti-choice. I think abortion should be mandatory for about 30 years. <laughs> That's a dangerous idea. She wanted a dangerous idea. So throw a chair at me. That is a very dangerous idea. I actually have to think about it for a minute. I, okay, I let's to go to Jermaine. Well, I'm always in the same place. The most dangerous idea, the one that terrifies us the most, is freedom. To actually be free is, to most human beings, disorienting, terrifying. But it's the essential bottom line, if you want to be a moral individual, you must be free to make choices, and that includes making mistakes. Peter. The most, the most dangerous idea in human history and philosophy remains the belief that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and rose from the dead. And that is the most dangerous idea you will ever encounter. I have to agree with that. Just Quickly, uh, this, I, I think you can't really leave it there. Why dangerous? I can't really leave it there because it alters the whole of human behavior and all our responsibilities. It turns the universe from a meaningless chaos 
uh, into, a, into a designed place in which there is justice and there, and there is hope. And therefore, we all have a duty to discover the nature of that justice and work towards that hope. It alters us all. If we reject it, it alters us all as well. It is incredibly dangerous. It's why so many people turn against it. Hannah Rosen. <laughs> I'm tempted to say something about the Jesus Christ being the Jewish <laughs> one on the panel, but uh, I'll let that one go. Um, given our conversation today, I think I'm going to go with we should watch our children less, that we live in a culture which follows our children around, is obsessed with safety, uh, decides everything for our children, doesn't let them have any freedom, doesn't let them wander, doesn't let them go anywhere, do anything by themselves, and we should, in fact, do less with our children, not more. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry to say that is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Jermaine Greer, Peter Hitchens, Hannah Rosen, Dan Savage. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. And a special thanks to the Sydney Opera House, a festival of dangerous ideas, the St. James Ethics Centre and our largest ever audience. Please give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you. Now then, Prime Minister Abbott has famously declared Australia open for business. Next week, Q&A will follow suit with a panel of business leaders facing your questions. The head of Santos Oil and Gas, David Knox. Businesswoman and chair of the Women's Leadership Institute, Carol Schwartz. The chair of the HSBC Bank and former uh, president of the Business Council, Graham Bradley. Nestle Australia chair, Elizabeth Proust. And the founder of Aussie Home Loans, John Simon. What would business leaders like to change about Australia? Join us on Q&A next week to find out. Good night.